Welcome everyone, good evening. Um, as many of you know already, in the Aberdeen Italian Circle is a part of the Dante Alighieri Society, a society based in Rome uh, that promotes uh, Italian language and culture around the world through a network of committees like ours. Uh, this year, 2021, we celebrate the death of the poet to which our society is dedicated, the poet Dante Alighieri. Uh, today in particular uh, is Dante Day, we celebrate Dante Day, and we are absolutely delighted to celebrate this, uh, to mark this important celebration uh, by welcoming a distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Jane Everson. Professor Everson is uh, <clears throat> Professor Emerita of Italian Literature at uh, Royal Holloway University of London in the School of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures. She first developed her interest in Italian literature at the University of Edinburgh, where she studied with the late professor Peter Brandt, graduating in French and Italian. She then went on to specialize in Italian uh, and uh, she studied for a doctorate at the University of Oxford in the field of Renaissance narrative poetry. She has held posts at the universities of Reading, Leicester and uh, Royal Holloway, University of London. In, in each of uh, these uh, posts, she regularly taught courses on Dante and his works. Among her many research publications, ranging from medieval and Renaissance literature, to the Learn Academies and the Enlightenment, mention should be made here of a study of translations of the episode of Brunetto Latini in Inferno 15. And in particular, in view of her talk today, of a detailed discussion of the ballet Dante Sonata in the volume Dante on View, the reception of Dante in the visual and performing arts, edited by Antonella Braida and Luisa Calais in 2007. In addition to her academic career and engagement with Italian studies, Jane Everson is a lifelong ballet fan and has taken classes from the age of three and she still does so and uh, take two classes per week now currently on Zoom. Before we move on and uh, let Professor uh, Everson um, start with her talk, I would like to mention another couple of publications uh, in addition to the Dante Sonata. And uh, Professor Everson has really published uh, widely in many different capacities as an editor, as an author, contributors. And I would like to mention particularly uh, writers and performers in Italian drama from the time to the, uh, for, from the time of Dante to Pirandello, as is in honor of uh, George uh, Harry McWilliam, and The Lost in Transit, Dante's Dialogue with Brunetto Latini and its English translations, 1805-1995. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ederson, and we can now uh, start with our event. If we are ready, when you are ready, Jane, you can, you can share your screen. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I'd like to begin, if I may, by thanking the Aberdeen Italian Circle for the invitation to give this lecture. It's a great honor to be asked to give a lecture on Dante Day, um, given that I'm not specifically a Dantista. Uh, and I'd like to thank you also, all of you, for um, joining, uh, joining me this evening. I'd like also, before I begin, to thank uh, both the Royal Ballet at, uh, in London and the Birmingham Royal Ballet for their help in preparing this paper, um, the information that they provided for me, uh, which has been extremely useful, particularly given that um, going to see live performances has not been possible in recent months. So I've entitled my uh, lecture Songs Without Words for obvious reasons, perhaps. Io vidi più folgor vivi e vincenti far di noi centro e di sé far corona, più dolce in vista, uh, più dolce in voce che in vista lucenti. Poi, si cantando, 
quegli ardenti soli si fur girati intorno a noi tre volte, come stelle vicine a fermi poli. Donne, mi parver, non da ballo sciolte, ma che saresti in tacite ascoltando finché le nove note hanno ricolte. In Paradiso Ten, Dante passes into the higher realms of the seven heavens and begins a sustained focus on harmonious movement expressed as dance accompanied by music, which continues from the circling movement of the souls of the wise here in Canto 10, through the dance-like formations of the cross and the eagle in Cantos 14 and 18 respectively, the, parable, the parallel movements of the souls on the celestial ladder in Canto 21, and Gabriel's dance around the star representing the Virgin Mary, to the last canti and the images of souls in constant joyful movement, and so to Dante's description of the river of light and the souls of the blessed in the celestial rose in Canto 30. Not all of the descriptions contain the words ballo or danza and danzare, but all of the instances express a habit of acute observation of types of movement which may seem unexpected in a poet otherwise celebrated for his intellectual and moral emphasis. This powerful sense of dancing by the souls in Paradiso is present in the illustrations of Botticelli to the Divine Comedy here on this slide, uh, right hand side, albeit in a static and two dimensional form. but one which it is easy to imagine converting via modern technology into real and visible movement. These passages from Paradiso and Botticelli's interpretation on paper would indicate that there is a close and obvious connection between Dante and dance, and that the comedy would have become a fertile source of inspiration for choreographers, at least since the emergence of ballet and theatrical dancing into the mainstream public theatres. Episodes from the comedy have, after all, frequently been interpreted in dramatic plays in the theatre and then in cinema, often in directions at variance with Dante's original emphasis. These dramas for the theatre and cinematic re realisations do, of course, contain a certain amount of movement, but they are not primarily about conveying mood and message solely through movement, as is the case with ballet. And it is worth remembering that the Commedia contains more than a hundred thousand words, while ballet uses none. Yet a close reading of the comedy reveals just how sensitive Dante is to the ways in which movement of various types conveys character, and both in the subject moving and in the observer is capable of provoking emotions, which in turn are translated into further movement. Through the different types of movement portrayed in the three parts of the poem, pointless and futile in Inferno, full of hope in Purgatorio, joyful and celebratory in Paradiso, Dante displays a deep sense of rhythm of either disharmony in Inferno or harmony in Paradiso and largely also in Purgatorio. It may thus seem all the more surprising that in contrast to the number of dramas based on the comedy, choreographers took so long to arrive at Dante's poem and translate into dance the striking combination of movement, rhythm and aesthetics that so mark the cantos of the poem. There are fundamentally just three classical ballets which take Dante's poem as their inspiration and all three have been choreographed in the last 100 years. I list them here. Frederick Ashton's Dante Sonata, uh, for um, first premiered in 1940, Ronald Tice's Inferno, which was uh, performed in 2014, and Wayne McGregor's The Dante Project, for which to date only The Inferno has been performed, 2019. And I've given you here uh, some links to Facebook and YouTube uh, materials from which I've taken some, some uh, clips that where if you want to explore further, uh, you can go on to, um, to them just by using the title or the name of the choreographer. All three are focused on the first part of Dante's comedy, and it is worth pausing to consider this preference. Con concentrating on Inferno may seem natural, and indeed most theatrical interpretations 
also focus on the first cantica. The Inferno is highly dramatic, full of strong characters and often characterized by violence, all of which make for compelling theater. Inferno is also often the only part of the comedy that the general public knows and so can relate to. And while in the light of my opening remarks, this neglect of the wonderful dance movements described in Paradiso seems odd, none, nevertheless, movement, disharmonious, violent and despairing is evident from the opening cantos of the Inferno as a reading of passages from cantos three, five and six demonstrates. And the violent dancing described by Dante in Inferno continues almost to the deepest depths of hell. Let me turn now to the ballets and come first to Ashton's Dante Sonata. The ballet was devised in the autumn of 1939 and first performed in London in January 1940. It is clearly marked by the anxieties and uncertainties of the years of the war. Indeed, Ashton is on record as suggesting that the ballet was a response to, and I quote, the whole stupidity and devastation of war. After the end of the war, when those uncertainties and anxieties no longer affected audiences in the same way, the ballet lost its appeal and was not performed again until the season 2000-2001, when it was staged by the Birmingham Royal Ballet in various cities, culminating in performances in London in early September 2001. Subsequently, it has remained in the Birmingham Company's repertoire and was due to be performed in the Lindbury Theatre at Covent Garden last year, 2020. The history of the presence or absence of Dante Sonata from the balletic stage and company's repertoires tells us something significant, I believe, about how ballet interpretations may be marked by aspects which may be transient of the time of composition and choreographic development in contrast with the perennial relevance of Dante's text. Ashton's ballet speaks to contemporary anxieties, fears and uncertainties, whether of wholesale warfare in the 1940s, terrorism in 2001, or the pandemic now. The ballet is a single act of just 17 minutes. As the title indicates, Ashton took his initial inspiration most directly from Liszt's piano sonata, Après une lecture de Dante, adapted for ballet by Constant Lambert, rather than from the text of Dante's poem. Ashton does not attempt to tell a narrative to put into balletic form one or more cantos or episodes of the poem. Rather, following Liszt, Ashton aims to convey an emotional response to the music and to develop a series of movements which translate those emotions into visual form. The ballet is based around the concept of a struggle between darkness and light, with the dancers divided into two groups, the children of light and the children of darkness, distinguished by the simple costumes, white for the former and black crisscrossed with snake-like sashes for the latter. Though tempting to understand this as a presentation of souls in hell, opposed, opposing saved souls or angels, bear out such an interpretation. The stage setting by Sophie Fedorovich is very simple. A plain dark backcloth decorated by a diagonal pathway order, which you can just see here behind the dancers, running from lower stage left to upper right. The lighting is also very subdued. Uh, <clears throat> most of the ballet is made up of ensemble movements by the whole core, as is evident in this slide with scarcely any set pieces for soloists. The types of movement used by Ashton are quite distinct from typical classical steps and poses being closer to modern ballet or less anachronistically for the times to the style of Isadora Duncan. The dancers are barefoot. There is a lot of use of the upper body, arms, shoulders, torso and of heads and especially for the women of their hair, which is worn loose. And you can see here a little bit more in close up um, some of that, uh, some of those features. In place of formal steps, the ballet is characterized by the alternation of heavy, slow movements, feet pressing into the ground, arms pulling tense and heavy into the chest. And you can see that some of that here again in this previous slide. 
passages of swift running, falling, spinning on the ground and lifting one or another dancer aloft. The overriding impression is of the whole group now clustering, now forming smaller groups, now circling, now piling into a pyramid of bodies. There are moments of lyricism in, partic in particular for smaller groups and in the rare duets interspersed with movements conveying anguish and despair and with confrontations between the children of light and the children of darkness as they alternately momentarily seem to triumph in an ongoing sense of struggle with no certain outcome. The ballet ends with the children of light grouped stage left and the children of darkness stage right and standing in the centre and gazing towards a shaft of light at the back of the stage, the principal female child of light, conveying in this pose a hint of hope of salvation. It would seem at first glance as if Ashton's ballet has little to do with Dante's poem, but it may already be apparent from this brief account that Ashton is drawing on a range of visual sources as inspiration for the movements choreographed. The original commentators on the ballet drew attention to his use of Flaxman's illustrations, and it was pointed out that these were brought to the rehearsals in 1939-40 to 40 in order to give the dancers an idea of the precise movements Ashton had in mind. Among Flaxman's illustrations that relate closely to movements and poses in the ballet, one can point to those for Caron, Paolo and Francesca, the Furies, Brunetto Latini, the Baratieri, Capocchio, and the falsificatori, but it should be stressed that often Ashton makes use of or derives ideas from only part of the Flaxman drawings, usually concentrating on the groups rather than an individual. The closest in terms of a precise evocation seem to me to be the piled up bodies of the falsificatori here in the bottom right, the bent over bodies which are reminiscent of Brunetto Latini on the left, the snakes on the costumes, which are reminiscent of the thieves who are tormented by snakes, and especially the extraordinary for ballet, backwards and head first drop by a child of light of one of darkness, which comes direct from the Baratieri image of Flaxman. I regret I have no image from the ballet to show you, but to see it done uh, in performance is quite heart stopping. Uh, and it's very, very reminiscent of this drawing. Other poses in the ballet, however, recall other illustrators, in particular Fuseli, whose illustrations are characterized by a much stronger sense of movement and action. Indeed, Flaxman's are often criticized as too static for the scene in question. Ashton clearly felt the need in a ballet to include soloists, even if briefly, and so devised short duets for a pair of children of light and a pair of children of darkness. The principals in the first case, which in the original performances were Margot Fontaine and Michael Soames, have a couple of lyrical and yearning pas de deux where some of the steps, and especially one of the lifts, come from Fuseli's illustration for Paolo and Francesca. And you have here the image I gave you for the poster and on the right, Fuseli's drawing of um, Paolo and Francesca. Ashton seems to borrow little from the other major illustrator, Gustav Doré, perhaps not least because Doré continually foregrounds Dante and Virgil, while Ashton uses neither figure. But there is one scene that does clearly derive from Doré, the image of the child of light pinned down in the shape of the cross, a form of crucifixion. Doré's image for Caiaphas, as, it's now, as is narrated in Canto 23. And here you have Doré on the left, and the crucifixion, the, the crucified figure has just been picked up by his uh, fellow white um, ch children of light. Illustrations such as these, even if conveying some sense of movement, are nonetheless a long way from the hectic, insistent and anguished mo movements, the pauses and rushes which characterize Ashton's ballet. For this reason, I am strongly of the view that he drew also directly on Dante's text. The simplest way to give the dancers sight of Flaxman's drawings in rehearsal as noted would have been via an English translation containing those illustrations. It would be surprising if Ashton had not at times dipped into the text. 
This is a hypothesis, but can be corro corroborated by comparing lines from Inferno and scenes from the ballet. To do this is to see Dante's text not just visualized, but animated in front of your eyes. The Birmingham Royal Ballet have a video of the full ballet, which they made available to me uh, in preparation for this. But for copyright reasons, I cannot show you this. I can, however, show this little pro promotional montage of still photos, which will give some sense of all the swirling, yearning, and at times violent movement, and will read a few lines from the Inferno as it plays. La bufera infernal che mai non resta meli spiriti con la sua rapina, voltando e percotendo li molesta. Di qua di là di giù di sum li mena, nulla speranza li conforta mai, non che di posa, ma di minor pena. The second Dante ballet, Ronald Tice's Inferno, provides a strong contrast to Ashton's interpretation. Tice's ballet, which was two years in the making, was premiered in Bellevue, Washington State in February 2014 by the resident ballet company. A completely new musical score was composed for the ballet by Glenna Burma, who collaborated closely with Tice, not only on the musical aspects, but also on costumes and decor. Tice's Inferno is very much a narrative ballet aiming to retell in dance Dante's account of his journey through hell. The ballet is made up of a series of scenes relating through balletic ensembles and solos, key episodes of Cantos of the Inferno. It is thus much closer in inspiration to some of the theatrical versions of the comedy, and in particular because of the costumes and face masks worn by many of the dancers. I show you here two, some devils on the left, and on the right, uh, two of the philosophers from the Bella Scuola um, in Canto IV. Uh, because of the costumes and face masks worn by many of the dancers, it is very reminiscent of medieval religious drama. This is not inappropriate in a way, but has the potential to appear pantomimic, if not carefully realized. Indeed, the reviews, it must be said, were not uniformly complimentary. A program note describes the ballet as a chilling and beautiful tour de force. Dante's Inferno combined original music and choreography, demonic dancing, dramatic costumes and handcrafted masks, end quote. But as one of the reviews pointed out, I quote again, the choreography intermittently stalled beneath elaborate props, costumes and cumbersome visual tricks. As in the case of Dante Sonata, this is a one act ballet and was performed as part of a triple bill. All three ballets on this program were devised as interpretations of mythology. And this hints perhaps at Tice's main interest in Dante's poem and his chosen interpretations. I have not seen Tice's ballet on stage and so relay, rely here on the published accounts and on the photos and video highlights available on the net. In the words of one reviewer, the ballet opens, quotes, with fog rolling across the darkly lit stage and on Dante lying on a platform lost in a metaphorical forest of sin, end of quote. Though, as you will see, I hope, it seems in the staging more like a pleasant woodland glade than a dark wood. Dante, Tice himself in the performance, I quote again, is joined by three feline masked ladies en pointe embodiments of lust, pride, and avarice, end quote, who represent the three terrifying beasts that Dante encounters in the opening canto. In the shadows in this first scene towards the back of the stage, the figure of Virgil appears. There then follow dance ensembles, including scenes depicting Paolo and Francesca, canto five, uh, here on the left, the Furies before the Dis, here on the right, the Devils of Malibolge, further down, that's Cantos 21 and 2. The Frozen Lake of Cocytus and the Figure of Satan from Cantos 32 to 34, with which Inferno culminates. In spite of this apparent closeness to Dante's text, Tice's ballet conveys much less the mood, emotions and atmosphere of Inferno than does Ashton's much less narrative interpretation. The three ladies representing the beasts of the first scene 
are not really at all terrifying, and the pas de quatre danced with them by the Dante figure is classical and lyrical, with some sense of antagonism, but no real sense of fear. This is the woodland glade, as I put it. Um, Anguish is largely absent from the next scene, uh, Paolo and Francesca, that we saw just now. There is no sense of whirlwind of being... There's no sense of whirlwind um, of being caught up in a bufera infernal and the movements are calm and elegant. The next scene from Canto VI represents the gluttons who are rolling large pipes or tubes around the stage, movements which are hard to interpret as relating to the canto. This is followed by the entrance of an over-literally costumed Cerberus who cannot help but seem ridiculous and pantomimic. As the ballet proceeds onwards or downwards, the Furies too in Dante's encounter with the Furies and Medusa at the city of Dis are rather unthreatening. They have rather the beautiful wafty veils, which we saw, which are used like wings to great effect, as we saw in the previous slide. If I can go back to it. Yes, here we are. Um, you see the wings there. Um, but again, in quite a lyrical pas de quatre with Dante. In contrast with the text uh, at this point in front of the city of Dis, the chief protagonist here is Dante. Virgil again lurks in the background and takes no part in overcoming the Furies. The Wood of Suicides, represented well on the backdrop by a withered tree, is danced by a single female dancer, who firstly dances alone, culminating in a pose representing hanging herself from the tree by her very long hair. Uh, Dante's text focuses, in fact, on male suicides. She then dances with three masked figures and two devils, and here there is more sense of pain and suffering in the movements. Phlegias and the Minotaur follow in an episode entitled The Fire Demons, which is very colourful. The women dressed in skirts to good effect. But there is again little sense of pain or threat conveyed and the Minotaur merely crosses the stage, passing Dante on the way. Tice does choose to choreograph what is certainly the most obviously theatrical episode of Inferno, Dante and Virgil's encounter with the Devils of Malibolge in Cantos 21 to 23. But unlike Dante's account, which does stress the pantomimic nature of the encounter, Tice has Dante and a, and a single demon or giant fight with battle axes while Virgil looks on. The ballet ends with Dante descending to the frozen lake of Cocytus and the figure of Satan. Tice does not stick closely to Dante's text here either, since this lake is clearly not frozen, but in wave-like movement, while Satan, whom Dante suggests is wafting his wings, is still and is again a rather pantomimic figure, far from terrifying. This is followed by an epilogue, which from the point of view of the comedy is a little confusing. It is entitled, Dante emerges into the night sky and to a vision and the three graces. Virgil is still present while Dante, who has been sleeping, is awakened to dance with the three graces while dawn gradually appears on the backdrop. Only that last phrase, dawn appearing on the backdrop, seems to me to fit Dante's text. Although each of the scenes represented involve a number of dances, dancers, Tice's Inferno is fundamentally a vehicle for the soloist dancing Dante. We see him here at the end of this video clip. The Virgil figure is not a dancing role, merely and literally a walk-on part, who only engages with Dante in some of the scenes and is not the dominant figure of Dante's own text. 
The ballet movements, as noted, oscillate between classical steps and poses, usually for the women, and figures crawling rather grotesquely around the floor of the stage. The female dancers are en pointe for most of the scenes, and this perhaps also adds a sense of distance to the viewer's experience, relating the ballet to the classical tradition rather than to the immediate present of its composition, as is the case with Ashton. Although the journal Dante Today speaks enthusiastically of the, and I quote, exciting music, demonic dancing and wild choreography, I have to say that I find the choreography rather unimaginative, the range of steps limited and predictable. In one sense, Tice is following Dante's poem closely, selecting episodes and attempting to convert them for the ballet stage. Yet some of the interpretation seems to stray quite far from the original, even in those scenes which are intended as directly related to the narrative, such as the Lake of Cocytus and Satan, which we have still here. The reasons for such conflicts of interpretation are hard to assess. Clearly a choreographer is at liberty to devise and interpret as he desires, but given the constant reference to Dante here, such strategy can be risky. Nor do I know what he consulted in preparation for the ballet. In the scene with Paolo and Francesca, there is again, as in Ashton, a lift which seems to reflect Fusley's illustration. While some of the demonic figures could perhaps be seen as drawing uh, on the illustrations by William Blake. But as noted above, the costumes, masks, and some of the movements seem derived from other traditions completely, from pantomime, farce, and even the circus. Moving to the third balletic in interpretation, we come very much into the present. McGregor's The Dante Project aims to recreate in dance all three cantique of the Commedia, unlike the previous two, but to date, as I said, only the Inferno has been completed and performed. The full ballet in three acts was scheduled for performance at Covent Garden in May 2020, but for obvious reasons the premiere was cancelled. The Royal Opera House has just this week announced that the premiere is now scheduled for October of this year, and so will form their contribution to the 700th anniversary celebrations. This was not, of course, the original intention. Indeed, it's doubtful, perhaps they knew about the anniversary, but it is a happy coincidence. A trailer was produced for the original 2020 scheduling from which I take this clip. There is presumably some choreography already devised for Purgatorio and Paradiso, but I have not yet been able to interview McGregor, who's been in the States, in fact, and so concentrate here on the Inferno, for which we have both images and reviews of performance. In common with the two previous ballets, the Dante Project is a close collaboration of the choreographer McGregor, the composer Thomas Adez, and the designer Tachita Dean. Indeed, in some respects, McGregor's way of working is reminiscent of Diaghilev, in its multidisciplinary approach, giving equal weight to each artistic form. Yet unlike Diaghilev, who supervised and directed all his artistic team, McGregor and his collaborators apparently worked separately and independently on their ideas for the ballet. Adez's score was premiered in May 2019, two months before the ballet was staged, and was acclaimed with a standing ovation for its own independent merits. Adez drew on Liszt's symphonic poems, reminiscent in this of Ashton's use of the same composer. Dean, as designer, listened to a recording of the Divine Comedy being recited or read, presumably in English, by the poet-actor Heathcote Williams, but also decided to link her interpretations to contemporary politics, and rather like the recent BBC Radio 4 programmes celebrating Dante's centenary, she was apparently influenced in developing ideas for the designs by both Brexit and the US Senate hearings into the Mueller report. The relevance of these, I have to confess, is not very clear to me and does not seem obvious in the stage designs she in the end produced. She claims to have embedded the name of the self-proclaimed grim reaper Mitch McConnell in the backdrop, which suggests to me that her interp interpretation, if not the ballet itself, might date rather fast. 
McGregor's Inferno, the first act of the Full Dante project, was premiered in Los Angeles in July 2019 as part of a two-day celebration connected with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and on that occasion performed in a mixed bill with other McGregor ballets. The Inferno it runs for 46 minutes, which is not only considerably longer than Ashton's, but also very much at the upper limit for an act of ballet, for which the norm would be 25 to 30 minutes. If Purgatorio and Paradiso are of similar length, then allowing for intervals, this will make for a long performance, even if not quite of Wagnerian proportions. The ballet is performed against an immense backdrop created in negative, so that ice, for example, appears as black, as are mainly in black unitards with white markings chalked on the body costume, which draw attention to the particular sin presented. The most obvious, indeed the only one mentioned in the literature, is the outline of the genitals for Paolo and Francesca. The lighting is appropriately subdued, and as the ballet progresses, the monochrome backdrop gradually acquires more colour and the costumes similarly seem to change colour. Dante is dressed in turquoise, you see him here, Virgil in orange, none of the slides I have show Virgil. McGregor's background is not in classical ballet but in modern and contemporary dance and he is renowned for working with a highly syncretic range of media and producing creations not only for dance and ballet but also for film, theatre, opera, fashion shows and television and he has a stimulating interest in the application of computer technology to choreography, which may prove very interesting when he gets to Paradiso. Biographical notes and articles describe him as radically redefining dance in the modern era. His choreography for ballet is variously described as pushing the dancers into extreme physical attitudes, twisting and wriggling and pulling limbs into drastic lines and in a Guardian article from 2011, uh, his choreography is described as marrying the sinuosity of contemporary dance to a fractured postmodernism, distinguished by its rattlesnake, so its rattlesnake speed, flickering detail, and extreme and often distorted articulation. And uh, I, this slide perhaps gives you some idea of the distortions of the bodies. The review in the LA canvas of the 2019 performance of Inferno in Los Angeles describes movements in the ballet thus, and I quote, their ominous form formations mix with the delicacy of the harps and strings, a playful yet sinful diaspora of the mountainous back to the mountainous backdrop drawn by Tachita Dean. They crawl, dispersing, rove in pirouettes and collapse. All of which would suggest that, as Elizabeth Kay suggests in the Royal Opera House in-house journal, McGregor is the ideal choreographer for Dante's poem, or at least for the Inferno. Indeed, the last phrase, roving in pirouettes, collapse, crawl, and so on, seems to echo the ideas of Dante's sonata. From the evidence available, McGregor is also aiming for a narrative approach, rather than Ashton's abstract evocation of mood, but with more sophisticated costumes and props than those used by Tice. Certainly the length of McGregor's Inferno and the casting of figures to represent Dante and Virgil indicate that he is trying to translate into dance precise episodes of the first cantica. Jane Rosenberg suggests as much, I quote from her article, designed to follow 13 levels of hell with adulterers, gluttons, popes, critics, flatterers, hypocrites and thieves in attendance. End quote. The programme notes for the Los Angeles performance describe the ballet as, and I quote again, a daring reconfiguration of classical language, that is a ballet, and as ambitious and experimental. Yet the images available from this performance seem to me to draw more on the traditions of classical ballet, in particular as developed from Kenneth Macmillan onwards. It is striking too that McGregor succumbs to putting his female dancers en pointe for some of the scenes, as you can see clearly here. In some ways then, McGregor's ballet seems less innovative and experimental than the moves choreographed by Ashton half a century ago. The trailer just shown confirms that reading. There is here, if not a lyrical elegance, certainly a sense of control, discipline and harmony in contrast with the anguish of Dante Sonata. 
the reviews, sorry, the reviewers of the Los Angeles performances had often contrasting views about the choreography and interpretation. Jane Rosenberg found in it, I quote, the harmonious pairing of contemporary dance with the grandest of classical forms, writing that, and I quote again, the result was movement designed for the rigors of the inferno, tragic yet timeless without cliche or excess. Inferno felt like a concentrated flow of movement as Dante descends deeper and deeper through the circles of hell, end quote. And she continues discussing the Royal Ballet dancers who actually performed uh, in Los Angeles, uh, discussing the interpretation thus, I quote again, Royal Ballet delivered a tour de force of expressive dancing. Edward Watson as, Dan as Dante here in the turquoise, the dramatic center of the piece, danced a fervid pas de deux with the powerfully tragic Fumi Kaneko. Uh, that's what's going on here. In the second pas de deux, with strings reminiscent of Stravinsky's Firebird, Francesca Haywood and Matthew Ball's dancing had a lushly elegiac quality, not perhaps quite so evident, but... Um, but Tam Warner, another reviewer, was less convinced, writing um, of the first of these, of these two pairings, Watson seemed uncomfortable dancing with Fumi Kaneko in this role. Like Jane Rosenberg, however, Deborah Levine is enthusiastic about the ballet, emphasizing, I quote, this fulsome pageantry, a whirlwind fusillade of bravura male dancing, a stage full of skyrocketing air turns, ripping pirouettes and dervish style spinning tops with a single leg stretched to the side. Uh, I haven't, this is the only other photograph I could find which doesn't quite give you that idea. She continues, for its successful interweaving of narrative, poetry, music, character and stagecraft, most notably for its close hewing to its score, this ballet strikes me as a throwdown auguring new possibilities for classical ballet. At the same time, Inferno has a marvelous retro feel, end quote. But Tam Warner remained unconvinced about the whole interpretation. He wrote, we were never pulled into this tempting underworld as Dante and Virgil seemed to illuminate by watching Impley. Good ideas abound here only to die away and finished with the dancers simply exiting without reason. And he continues, as the ending neared, the music swung into full circus mode as male dancers rushed the stage, turning, leaping, falling and crawling, they danced with remarkable technique and energy. Though it had moments of exhilaration, it missed the full knockout it could have been. Without clear direction, it began to fall apart and look under rehearsed. Again, Dante and Virgil seemed to be merely observers. Interestingly, for this survey of Dante ballets, McGregor, in a couple of instances, seems deliberately to echo Ashton's choreography. Both Warner and Levine highlight, as Warner has just put it, movements of turning, leaping, falling and crawling, and Levine of angst-driven solos, descriptions which equally apply to Dante Sonata. And the ballet ends, that's to say McGregor's ballet ends again, in Warner's description, finally Dante lifted his face to a shaft of light, the promise of better things to come, one could only hope, which is very reminiscent, of course, of the ending of Dante Sonata. Clearly, McGregor's ballet proved controversial and produced strongly worded reactions. Some of the interpretation also seems to depart completely from Dante's text, uh, an ice queen appears uh, towards the end of the ballet, which I couldn't quite understand. It will be interesting to see how McGregor's The Dante Project develops and what the reactions of UK audiences and critics are when it is performed on this side of the Atlantic. And there may be some danger perhaps now in making it coincide with the centenary. Three ballets discussed here relate to Dante's text in different ways, and all have points of interest. It is too early to conclude on the success or otherwise of the Dante project. Tice's Inferno is a theatrical production, emphasizing the grotesque and pantomimic, and using conventional choreography to create a mainly visual spectacle. In spite of the preparatory reading of the comedy, 
Tice's interpretation does not really come close to realizing the emotional range expressed in Dante's poem, and for the audience remains a spectacle to be enjoyed, something distinct from their own lives. Ashton's, on the other hand, in eschewing the narrative approach, succeeds in creating for the audience, as well as the dancers, an intensely emotional and even cathartic experience. It is also, in my view, the most experimental in terms of movement. All three ballets, when performed, have been presented in conventional theatres and on flat stages, often distant from the audience. Comments on performances of Ashton's ballet in larger theatres after the end of the war pointed to a loss of connection due to the distance between audience and dancers. So let me, in conclusion, return to the Paradiso and offer perhaps a suggestion towards MacGregor's third act. Dante's descriptions of dancing in Paradiso emphasize circular movements, and readers often struggle to imagine in particular the celestial rose of Canto 30 as it develops from a river and a lake. These canti call out for performance in the round, for which the ideal place, at least in London, is the Royal Albert Hall where in normal years, there is a short season of classical ballet performed by the English National Ballet. Here the audience sit like the souls of the blessed in rising tears, looking down on the circular floor and the circling dancers. And that circularity challenges choreographers and producers to reconfigure classical ballet ensembles from the flat and distant stage to something more intimate and viewed from all sides. Here then, to finish, is an image from a ballet which depict, which despite its tragic story, is for me, in its re-choreographed version, the perfect interpretation of the words of Paradiso and Botticelli's drawing with which I began. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. This, this was just wonderful. I would just like to invite uh, our audience to ask questions if they wish to do so, and they can do um, uh, so by writing, typing uh, their question in uh, the chat box, or uh, you can unmute your microphone, providing that we manage to do it without talking over each other. Uh, we can perhaps start, I can perhaps start uh, and ask the first question. And I wonder, um, why do you think it took so long uh, for ballet um, to draw on Dante's Divina Commedia? Because it's a relatively <laughs> recent. <laughs> well, I suppose um, in one sense, I think the, um, the fact that ballet developed out of court dance uh, and was for uh, a long time really very formal um, and um, uh, I suppose, well, I, I suppose what I was saying about the, the distance, you know, the, 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 the audience being quite distinct, you know, uh, and separate from, um, uh, from, from the actual performers yes. doesn't help. It's also the case that even um, in terms of say straight theater, the big development takes place in the 19th century um, and tended to focus, as indeed artistic representations do, on certain key episodes. Um, so there are, some, there are some ballets in the 19th century which are literally just Francesca, Paolo and Francesca, um, and, and presumably like the theatrical representations and the, and the art, um, very much romantic and, and quite different from Dante's understanding um and i suppose i mean it is a it is a huge challenge i mean i am very interested to see what mcgregor will do with the whole thing to you know <laughs> of course of course of course that, that's that's very true is there anyone who wish to to step up and ask a question now that we have broken the ice <laughs> <laughs> Is, there is actually another thing that um, uh, I was curious about. Do you have any um, knowledge of um, what was the critical reception by Italian scholars of, of Dante? Uh, 
No, I don't actually. Um, although one of the articles that I read came, as say, from, from Dante today, which is a kind of fairly um, kind of generic um, journal. Um, when I when I wrote the um, the more uh, extensive study of the of Dante Sonata, um, there were certainly no no comments from Dante scholars about that. Um, it would be interesting uh, if uh, I haven't been able to talk to Ronald Tice either. He has a post in one of the universities in America, uh, and it would I mean, in that sense, he he could be plugged into you know uh, the world of Dante scholars. Um, McGregor, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, again, um, what I don't know with McGregor is why he conceived the idea to start with. Um, you know, because to do the whole thing is really such an enormous undertaking. Um, uh, it would be interesting. I, I'd hoped uh, when I was first thinking about this to be able to talk to him in London, but um, I think he was already in the, he has a post also in the States. And I think he was already in the States when lockdown came in and he's been there. Um, presumably he'll be coming back after Easter to start rehearsing in London, but um, But no, it would be interesting to know because, uh, I mean, I suppose in one sense, of course, uh, Dante scholars might be quite critical because the interpretations do diverge quite a lot from the text. Um, but then, uh, as I think I was trying to suggest, you, you've got to, you've got to understand the drive of a choreographer. Absolutely, uh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, I mean, in in a, in in ballet, as as indeed in any theatrical representation of of uh, the comedy, you have to be selective. You can't you can't tell everything. Uh, you know, even if you were only putting on say a one act, you know, one episode, um, it has to be selective. Definitely. Is there any member of the audience who would like to intervene and say anything, make a comment, or ask a question? We are still in time. Um, could I say ask? Of course. Are the, I didn't quite understand. Are the MacGregor, Purgatorio and Paradiso actually finished now? Uh, well, I don't know that. I mean, I assume that they are, because yeah. if he's now going to be rehearsing um, you know, for October, I presume they are. Uh, at what point he finished them, I don't know. Obviously, they were not done in time for the 2019 Inferno. Um, but as I say, I, I mean, if he runs to 46 minutes, you know, three acts each of 46 minutes, plus you have about half an hour of an interval between them. <laughs> yes, although most people are more interested in the Inferno than they are in the Purgatorio and the Paradiso. Um, generally, you know, people have all read the Inferno, but they then tend not to read the whole divine comedy. No, although I think, as I say, uh, in fact, um, from the choreographic point of view, I think the, the Paradiso should be, uh, could be quite wonderful um, yeah. and really could provide a wonderful way of understanding what Dante himself is visualizing, which is one of the extraordinary things about Dante's um, you know, visual sense, that he has this ability to, uh, you know, to, to um, to imagine, um, move, well, in this case, movement, but to imagine uh, in ways that are so far in advance, apparently, of his time. I mean, the, the wonderful bit at the beginning of Purgatorio when the angel boatman arrives, which is pure cinema, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and yet, you know, centuries before, he's able to kind of convey that idea. Um, so I think, you know, the, the Paradiso, in my view, uh, should be a, a, a really beautiful ballet, but it'd be interesting to see what McGregor does with it. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Yes, yes, Francesca, sorry, I didn't see you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, I would like to uh, have a little comment, maybe, uh, make a comment. Now, I am not a dentista, but I think I would like to say something. I've spent most of my life at university studying Dante. Um, I was so intrigued. I wanted to uh, listen to Jane because I just had no idea how 
they would present, she would present, or the ballot indeed has presented uh, our sacred monster, uh, il nostro sacro <laughs> mostro Dante, che è uno dei, dei soggetti più commentati, criticati in tutto il nostro mondo italiano e, e, e del resto del mondo. Ma quello che io non riesco a capire è questo. Um, io penso, nel, nel mio modesto, nella mia modesta opinione, che Dante ha creato un lavoro unico che si basa specialmente pensando all'epoca nel 200 quando è stato scritto sulla immaginazione l'immaginazione che è la cosa più grande che può o creare visioni di paradiso oppure come lui ha dimostrato di inferno ora io non, non penso che presentare un balletto anche se dei tre magari sarei propensa a dire che io preferisco Ashton, ma ehm, non vedo questa necessità di creare, scusatemi se dico questo, però ehm, io sono un po' una purista che penso che l'opera di Dante sia grande semplicemente come lettura, lettura magari un po' di musica come abbiamo visto un po' l'altra sera abbiamo ascoltato una musica un po' immaginaria eh, di mandolino, però io penso che a vedere queste visioni eh, di ballerini per me non, non mi fa pensare al mondo dantesco, anzi mi distoglie da, dal mondo dantesco, mi fa distrarre perché non penso più all'opera di Dante e quest... io penso che è un po' come le cose moderne di oggi che si vuole eh, far sorprendere il pubblico, ma sarei anche io molto interessata a sentire un po' che cosa ne pensa la critica, che sono naturalmente molto più esperti di me, però io da italiana o, o, scusatemi, eh, però io mi sento molto appassionata su questo tema e da italiana devo dire che non approvo. Io non andrei a vedere questo balletto perché per me Dante è sacro e mi piace, sono incantata dalla sua rappresentazione e che cosa apporterebbe per il, il pubblico in generale. Questi spettatori andrebbero a ricercare il vero Dante? Non credo. Oppure magari lo voglio augurarmelo. Però ecco che cosa io penso. Scusatemi, eh, però non potevo no, frenarmi. Fine, <ride> complimenti, però complimenti a Jane, perché veramente eh, è stato interessantissimo eh, questo, non è, non è colpa di Jane, <ride> scusatemi. No, 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 no Francesca, that, that, that's fine, we can all express our opinion. Uh, of course, you know, we all have a different uh, point of view and uh, obviously it has been written so much about Dante, it's 700 years of, uh, uh, you know, interpretations and uh, performances and, uh, you know, it has been, um, He has influenced so many artists, painters, sculptures, yeah. not, not, only, not only dancers. So where, where do we stop? <laughs> you know, yeah. it, 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 is, it is difficult. And I suppose it is the same when we go to watch a movie that is based on a novel that we, we have read before, you know, we, we have our own visualization of that particular novel or that particular work. But I think it, it, is, it is important that, that we keep the dialogue open and uh, you know, that, that we see how the work of a, such an important poet in our culture um, has had such an impact in uh, other cultures around the world. Yes. I, think, yeah. I think that um, one has to also appreciate that not everyone approaches Dante from the same perspective. I mean, obviously an Italian, um, who has undoubtedly done Dante at school, um, starts from a particular um, perspective and, and, if you like, he kind of 
purist textual perspective. Um, but I have to say that one of the people who heard me give the shorter form of this um, earlier this month has been inspired to get hold of the text and read it. Oh, so cool. I think you have to take on board that people can be drawn to Dante's text from many different angles. Yes. And if they are drawn by the ballet into Dante, then um, that's not a bad thing. No. Um, um, and, mm. and the same was true many years ago now when uh, Peter Greenaway wrote, uh, did his uh, television Dante. Um, and there were, there were people who were enthused by the comedy as a result of seeing that interpretation, which was extremely interesting and imaginative, but, um, but you know, they, they would never have picked up Dante at all uh, if they hadn't seen that. Um, so I think, you know, one, one has to appreciate that outside Italy, um, people are going to come to Dante from, from many different angles. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that, that in itself explains, I think, some of the differing interpretations, um, in this case with the ballet, but the, the theatrical interpretations, cinematographic interpretations and so on, and even the artistic interpretations, which are, um, uh, are many of them produced from outside Italy. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, obviously I'm an Italianist and, and like yourself, I, I love the text and the poetry of it and, and so on. Um, but Dante is a, a, you know, if, if we, I mean, if we want Dante to remain as he is a, a world figure, I think we have to yes. um, understand that not everybody is going to engage with the text in Italian. No, I thank you very much. I agree with you there. Yes, and, and I thank you again for your lecture. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Francesca. Is there anyone else who would like to ask anything or make a comment? Um, please um, note that I cannot see everyone, so uh, feel free to <laughs> unmute yourselves if, if you want to intervene, because uh, even with the um, general view, I may miss somebody. Um, but if there isn't anyone, I would just like to thank Jane very much for a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. And we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to um, thank also our audience and um, also mention our next appointment. Our next appointment uh, that is going to take place on a Tuesday, exceptionally this time, Tuesday 13th of April, when Imogen Corrigan is going to present about the mosaics of Ravenna, which mm -hmm. is another Dantesque <laughs> location. So I hope that you will join uh, us then. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much indeed and uh, see you all very soon. Thank you.